Hey there, Tony. It's good to see you back on the show again. It's been a while. Uh, as usual, it's it's under uh, bad circumstances sometimes. Well, unfortunately, Corey, but that seems to happen to us a lot these days. It, That's it, just something to do with those guys in Ottawa, I think. I think it does. As you might have caught part of my rant. I'm not typically very happy with them anyways. But, I mean, with <laughs> you guys are national, and, and, and rightly so, because, I mean, there are – firearm owners who are having their rights uh, stepped on from, from coast to coast in Canada. This isn't just a Western issue. This is uh, this is nationwide. I, I guess we'll start with it because, I, I mean, the, the development with C21 is a, a little newer. But first of all, I'd like to talk about you guys are, are have launched a challenge when it comes to that uh, handgun uh, freeze, basically. Yeah, actually, the challenge is, is against not just the handgun freeze. The challenge is against all of C21 because, quite frankly, it wasn't written properly. There's a you know a bunch of things that are black letter law in the writing of legislation. You have to do A and B in order to get C, and they have completely messed it up. Uh, we think we have decent grounds to declare the legislation null and void, and we're going to pursue that on, on a technical basis. But also, one of the things they did in there with the handgun legislation was the first thing they did was they reduced our handguns to a value of zero. And they did this because you can't transfer them in any way, shape, or form. So by making them untransferable, they now have a value of exactly zero. And when you pass away, the the handguns obviously go to your next of kin, except this time they don't. They go to the federal government, and they don't have to pay compensation because the value is zero. Now, this is absolutely wrong because they were the ones who made the value zero. And in doing so, they trampled all over existing uh, Canadian legislation in this. And that's why we launched the challenge, because these things are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, we're looking right now 1.1 million handguns in Canada. Give an average price of about $1,500 and do the math on that one. And you're quickly over a billion. And... Uh, this this is unconscionable that you can take, you know, one and a half billion dollars of generational wealth that belongs to the citizens of Canada and make it disappear by going poof. That's ridiculous. Who the hell thought that up? Well, and, and, and firearms, I mean, they're property. They're an investment. I mean, some of them were handed right. down from people prior to us. Some of us saved our money and we purchased them. Uh, I mean, the property right aspect alone, I mean, never mind all the rest of whether this is effective legislation or making anybody safer or any of that. It's our property. And the government, as you said, I mean, it's, it's a roundabout way to I talked earlier on, I feel it's a theft, even if they compensate you for it. But their way of, OK, we're just going to turn the value to zero, because as you said, if you can't transfer or sell something, it is de facto right. zero, uh, right. then they'll take it for nothing. It, it, it's beyond the pale. Well, sure. And 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 they're stuck in in. Uh, between a rock and a hard place because there's legislation that's gone through the Supreme Court years and years ago that say that if they're going to take your property, they got to compensate you fair market value for it. Well, the, these son of a bitches just reduced fair market value to nothing. Like this is insanity. And we don't think this will withstand a court test. Courts tend to be pretty practical for the most part. Well, I certainly hope not. I, I mean, I guess this is something... Uh... We, we want to get this res resolved as fast as possible, but uh, it's not the same as a, an immediate illegalization or seizure. So people still can hang on to their property until hopefully when that this court challenge goes through and, and hopefully wins. Uh, what sort of timeline are you looking at with that? Well, you, you're, you're looking the, for the challenge probably a year and a half anyway. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could happen. There's many, many, many chess pieces moving politically right now on this. Uh, just just yesterday, Saskatchewan said they aren't going to play, and they're not going to let the citizens of Saskatchewan play either. So you're, they're not even going to uh, do anything with this stinking legislation. And we're expecting our friends in Alberta will do the same possibly even New Brunswick and Yukon and Manitoba. We're still working on Ontario, and we still get a no comment out of the Ontario government. They're still not uh, willing to stick their neck out far enough to say that we should be spending the billions of dollars it will cost to collect all these firearms and actually spend it on crime control. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, there's, again, so many levels. I mean, the, the amount of money 
being wasted on on every level and kind of move on to the other uh, firearms they're going after too. And we were talking about billions of dollars. I remember making this case a long time ago with the failed registry when they spent $2 billion on that, that, that pointless endeavor. It, how many crimes would have prevented perhaps if they'd have put $2 billion into substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment or supports, yep. things like that. That's how you prevent crime. That's how you make people safer. Instead, they flushed it away on a $2 billion bureaucracy that served nobody. That's right. And when, and when questioned under oath, the uh, commissioner of the RCMP, when asked, how many crimes has this solved? They said none that they were aware of. I mean, oh. it, it's, just, it's just one of these ultra-left, woke ideological things that's a lot like unicorns and, and tooth fairies and stuff like that. And and they think that because they, they put a regulation on it, criminals will stop misbehaving. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just wishful thinking on, on every part. And, you, you know, you can base your policies on, on fairy dust and unicorn snot, but quite honestly, it's not going to go anywhere. Right. And Canadians are buying into this. This is the part that's so absolutely amazing. The Canadians are buying into this nonsense. Um, and we have to inform. I mean, it's just the reality is, okay, the firearms owners are now a minority within the country. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have their, their abilities in that, but it does mean that the majority right. doesn't necessarily understand what comes with responsible ownership or the mindset, uh, again, with the vast, vast majority of people never want to hurt a fly. That's not why they got any firearms. Uh, just uh, actually, one of my commenters also pointing out, you might have seen that video uh, in, in a Calgary LRT station, they were shooting each other with a flare gun. Like criminals will find ways to get dangerous, uh, no matter what laws you, you, know, you put in place against the law abiding. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, democracy is not based on the rights of the majority. Democracies are based upon the rights of the minorities. And and quite frankly, we, we expect our governments to protect the rights of minorities. And if we're a minority, that just means we need even more protection than we did before. Absolutely. And, and I wrote about it last week as well, because I've always felt it's been the liberal agenda since Cretchen's days and into today. Yeah. They want to disarm. They want to take every firearm out of every Canadian's hands. And uh, this is just the, the new move on to it. So rather than the registry route, now they're incrementally doing it through things like C21. And they're taking advantage of tragedies. I mean, the timing's no mistake. Every time they make another grab is just after another tragedy. Yeah, and that's right. So this time they're going after... Uh, they, they've expanded it in committee, so this won't even get discussed in Parliament. Uh, basically, hunting rifles. Right, and and you know when you when you look back at this, you're absolutely right. The goal is to completely disarm Canadian society, but if the people that they're disarming aren't the ones that are committing the crimes, and they're not, and that aren't of all these people produces no positive effect on criminal activity in the country in any way, shape, or form, and it doesn't, you have to ask yourself the big question. Why are they spending so much time and money to do this? That's, Why I do they need the public of Canada so effectively helpless? It's, it's, it's ideological, and, and uh, I do believe, I mean, it, I, I, you know, an authoritarian is always nervous if the population is able to fight back if they push things too far. Right, but what do you think they're going to do that's so bad that the Canadian people would rise up against them? I mean, this just if you think about this, they're doing this for a reason. They're spending billions of dollars over decades to do this. And I don't think it's just because they've been influenced by a Hollywood movie. There's more to it than this. And they're not telling us what it is. No, oh, and they're failing. I mean, the public, the firearm owners, we don't trust them. They, they can... Uh, you know, recategorize and legalize whatever they like. I suspect, and I won't counsel people to commit crimes, but a whole lot of people are not going to turn in their firearms. That what it will do is turn those people into criminals as far as the law is concerned. I mean, in reality, they're not harming anybody. But mm -hmm. I, I can't see wide compliance with this. Not when it comes down to the hunting rifles now. No, and, and you know, some, some of the firearms they've taken are, are, are put on the list incredibly common firearms absolutely so common you wouldn't believe it and and some of them there's like half a million examples of one type of firearm and are all non-restricted 
So how do you know where they are? Well, the answer is you don't. And, you know, when you're talking about compliance, well, you know, my office is sort of like a, a hub of what's happening with compliance. I haven't had a single person yet that say, oh, yeah, I'm going to march right down there and give them my guns. And, you know, the, this compensation thing, this is wishful thinking. Like we, we put compensation into our lawsuit, not because we expect the government to give us money, but how else do we restore the value of the guns that they've devaluated? If there's a, a compensatable amount when, when you perish, at least they're worth something at this point in time. And I think that the, the average Canadian's hair would stand straight up if they honestly found out how much money we're really talking about with all the long guns that they've got now added into this and the handguns, we're looking at about a third of the, the guns in the entire country. And my guess, eight to $10 billion, billion with a B. For and that's nothing. just the bio. That's not the administration figuring out how to get these things, how to <laughs> process, how to, to deal with it. I mean, I, and, yeah. and that's something to keep reminding Canadians of, even if you don't have the firearms, even if you don't care if it's taken away from your neighbor. Okay. But are you ready to reach into your own pocket to pay for it? Because this is going to cost you. Well, at this point, I guess it's reaching into your great grandchildren's pocket, isn't well, it? Yeah, there is yeah. that. That's kind of a <laughs> separate discussion yeah. altogether. And, and I mean, yeah. I wonder about some of the other hiccups. Uh, I mean, this is kind of out of the blue, but have you ever been in, in communication with some of the First Nations communities? Like somebody had pointed out that yeah. uh, apparently a lot of First Nations people use uh, SKSs for hunting. I mean, it's a, a low priced, uh, you know, very common actually carbine that people yeah. use, it's utilitarian. And uh, yep. that, that's a tool for their livelihood and survival on those isolated communities. Uh, you're you're going to be taking away something very important to them. And I, I don't think the government's thinking that through on the problem they'll have going after those. No, they, they, they aren't. And I don't even think they care. You know, that they'll make a policy where they're not going to prosecute it in certain spots and on other places they will. But mostly it'll be a, a, a charge laid as opportunity presents itself to lay the charge. The thing with the SKSs, like I say, half a million of them in Canada right now, mm -hmm. all non-restricted. I can tell you, honestly, both my kids got their first deer with an SKS. These things are absolutely perfectly acceptable hunting firearms. They work. They always work. They're inexpensive and very, very common. On First Nations, the first thing they banned were the, the Ruger Minis the series of mini rifles. And th those minis were, were not banned in the first round of this gun control legislation. And the reason they weren't banned back then, I was around back then working on the legislation. The reason was, was because they were so ubiquitous within the First Nations. And they didn't want to get the, the First Nations all riled up at them. And so they left the minis off the list, even though that was the time when it was still hot and fresh from the Montreal massacre. But now they've gone ahead, banned all the minis and banned all the SKSs. And quite frankly, I, I think they, they've, take, they've got a tiger by the tail on this one. I don't think compliance will be anything. No, I mean, provinces won't cooperate. Uh, our, our firearms, uh, chief firearms officer in Alberta, she's fantastic, actually. Yeah, she <laughs> is. Quite outspoken. She's, she's not going to be helping along with this in Saskatchewan. And certain other provinces, they, they don't want to take on this this headache. They, no. they got better things to do. Well, I mean, all we can do, though, we got to keep fighting back or we will lose. I, I, I guess kind of before I let you go, I really appreciate the work you guys are always doing, keeping people up to date. I like reminding people, too, the CSSA has, you do stuff other than lobbying. I mean, you got all kinds of resources there that a member has as a firearm yeah. owner, whether it's uh, videos for, say, firearm operation or different sports or things like that. Uh, maybe let, let's yep. a little about your organization before I let you go. And, and, and uh, the best insurance products for firearms owners anywhere in the country. Uh, we also insure firearms and hunter safety instructors all over the country. And we have some really fantastic products. We're also uh, offering the only, uh, you know, uh, first aid courses that are developed specifically for shooting ranges. Um, lots of stuff. There's so many things I can't, I can't take all this time to say them all, but we're always working hard for our members. Right. And I, I just really appreciate the work you do. And, and again, I just like to remind everybody, it's more than just lobbying. I mean, if you're a firearm owner, that's a resource. As you said, everything from the insurance to, to safe firearm use. And uh, yeah, like anything you take seriously, you should join an association of others and, and work together. Because if we don't stand up for ourselves together, we're done for. 
Well, our track record speaks for itself. In 62 years of existence, we have had exactly zero fatalities on our shooting ranges. Yeah, excellent. So I, be hey, I, I bet you the police can't, can't say that. that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you, you can't have a ski hill claim that. No, exactly, exactly. You know, so we're very, very safe. It reflects in our insurance rates. And, uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful pastime for those people who've never tried it. They really should get out there and try it. They fall in love with it right away. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Tony. And I, I know you got a lot to do. We'll, we'll be keeping an eye on it and uh, we'll hopefully win this in the long run. Thank you, Corey. Great. Thanks. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. You become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. The current Lethbridge feed grain prices are as follows. Cash barley remains at 450. Feed wheat is steady at 464 and corn is unchanged at 457 per ton. In the milling wheat markets, March Minneapolis futures dipped 11 and a half cents at 926 with local hard red spring bid for January movement at 11.75 per bushel delivered. Over to the oil seeds, nearby canola futures spiked $24.70 at 839.50 per ton, with delivered values for December movement at 18.81 per bushel. In the pulse markets, nearby red lentils are sideways at 33 cents a pound, and yellow peas are at 12.75 per bushel. And in the cattle markets, February live cattle climbed 62.5 cents at 156.05 per hundred weight. For more information on pricing and picked up on farm options, give me a call at 403 394 1711. I'm Vera Buziak at Marketplace Commodities, accurate real time marketing information and pricing options. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access. 